All right, it's 11.05, and we'll get started. So my name's Tim Pitchell, and I'm a member of the Department of Psychology, and I've been researching procrastination since 1995 when I finished my own doctorate. And I did my doctorate on goal pursuit, and I was interested in what people were doing and how it made them feel. And I realized more and more that what the story was about was what people said they were going to do and didn't do. And that's when I turned the corner in my own research. So what I'm going to talk about today is a research focus on what we understand about procrastination. And in this, I'll tell you lots about what you might do about it. But let me begin where we all live. Here's a poem I'd like to read to you. He had a year to do it in, so brush the thought away. A chap with half his energy might do it in a day. A year was too ridiculous, as everyone should find. However, he would get it done and have it off his mind. But not today. A few months hence would suit him better still. Meanwhile, a far less irksome job might occupy his skill. He would not let the matter pass entirely from him, no. And, and doubtless he might take it up and say, a month or so. He had six months to do it in, for six long months had flown. Well, why should that alarm a chap with talents like his own? The job, once once embarked upon, would soon be rattled through. However, he would think of it and say, a week or two. He had three months to do it in. Oh, brother, was his cry. The thing hangs on me like a weight each day that passes by. Let's see, three months, ah, oh, that's enough. But just to clear the doubt, make arrangements for a start before the month is out. He had a week to do it in, and care was in his glance. It's hard, he cried, that flight of time won't give a chap a chance. He still delayed the swift week past, as weeks will ever run. And though a year was given him, the task was still undone. And I love that poem. I first used this poem when I gave a presentation like this to the graduate students of the University of Western Ontario. And I could see everybody cringing. <laughs> I read it. Because this is where oftentimes we live, especially as students. And that's one of the reasons you'd come here as TAs to talk about what do we do with students who procrastinate? Because I would say it is the biggest problem in education. And it's only growing because more and more we expect more and more of students to work independently. So not only did first year always mean that you didn't have to go to class and you didn't have to do your assignments, but now we want to do everything online as well. And so it, the, the amount of self-regulation that's required is huge. So what am I going to do over the next 45 minutes or so? Well, I'm going to explain what procrastination is and what it is not, because there's an important distinction to be made, and understanding the difference is half the battle. And then I'm going to talk about the consequences of procrastination. Come on, please sit. There's some seats over here, too. Uh, the consequences of procrastination isn't just the all-nighter, and it's not as benign as we might think. And then what I'm going to spend the bulk of my time on is talking about this procrastination puzzle. In 2010, on my last sabbatical, I wrote a book called the, uh, Solving, oh, no, Procrastinator's Digest, A Brief Guide to Solving the Procrastination Puzzle. And it was that time when I put together the idea that, well, it really is like a puzzle, and we have some of the pieces, and that's what I'm going to present to you today. So I'm going to present four major overall pieces, actually five, and then I'm going to take some of those apart. I am in the process of that going to summarize various strategies for change and they'll be related to parts of the puzzle like oh it's me it's my personality or it's those stupid tasks that I have so the nature of the goal or it's the way I think I perseverate on things all the time I'm really a negative thinker or I just don't have the willpower so I'll address each of those as I go unlike a lot of workshops that I give there's going to be very little time for Q&A I'm going to talk at you, which is all right. I think that we can learn a lot by listening to people. As much as people diss the lecture and the sage on the stage, I think they've got it wrong. <laughs> that classes are only 36 hours long, and it, it wouldn't be a bad idea to listen to someone for 36 hours, and then go do your work. Um, it's funny for me as an educator, because right now I'm trying to learn something new. I want to get my amateur radio operator's license, ham radio. And it's going back to physics that I've forgotten from first year. And, I have to take a test, 100 multiple choice items. So it reminds me of all my psychology students. And I know the work that's involved. And so oftentimes we think that all our classes should be taken up with talking. But actually, it doesn't hurt to listen and then go away and rehearse it. So that's what I'm going to spend my time on today. But if you have a question of clarification, if you didn't understand something, by all means, stick up your hand. It's just that I won't be able to necessarily elaborate 
on different ideas because I really want to get to the end of this to give you the whole story. Make sense? But feel free, as much as I'm saying that we don't have a lot of time for Q&A, if you have a question or clarification, I'd be happy to answer that. Before I go there, I want to do, show you just a couple of more slides that really shows us that procrastination is something we seem to understand very well. Here's a poster we see a lot. Procrastination. Hard work often pays off after time, but laziness always pays off now. <clears throat> Actually, I could give the whole talk from this, just this one slide. And in fact, I just reviewed the galleys of a paper that we're publishing, a colleague from uh, Bishop's University, who you'll see in a moment. And in that, we talked a lot about this notion of giving in to feel good. At its heart, procrastination is the fact that, hey, it will pay off now if I don't do my work. And the other hard work, that may pay off later. This is a, the flip side of that. This paper that we're just publishing now is about the future self. It says, procrastination. If a job's worth doing, it'll still be worth doing tomorrow. But this picture is so good because it, imagine looking at that kitchen tomorrow. It's easy to think, oh, I don't feel like doing the dishes. Very few people want to do the dishes when dinner's over. Particularly if there's been any wine involved in the meal. It's like, I don't want to do those dishes. But the, the really peculiar part is that unless you're leaving those for your roommate, which could lead to a lot of hostility, you're leaving them for yourself. And tomorrow when you go to those dishes, you know what they're like. Now it's caked on. Some of the plates are stuck. What are we doing to future self? And even in your work as a TA, you're going to see that this has a lot of an important focus because we somehow believe that, well, we don't even think about future self. If we can just bring future self into clearer vision, Lots of times the procrastination may go away. And the last one is probably the biggest lie. Procrastination. By not doing what you should be doing, you could be having this much fun. Well, that is the biggest piece of self-deception because I think one of the reasons I got fascinated with procrastination was that for my doctoral studies, I interviewed graduate students. I interviewed graduate students at the doctoral level because very few people seem to study doctoral students. And I remember interviewing someone in in the, the low building, I won't say which department, but it wasn't uh, sociology, who was 30 years old. She had completed two masters already and a law degree and was working on her PhD and she was troubled by her procrastination. I was thinking, that doesn't make any sense at all. But it's a huge problem with our studies and when we put things off, we somehow believe that we're going to be having a lot of fun. But in fact, the bane of our existence and what I learned in this interview was it's the tremendous amount of guilt we feel. Guilt is a paralyzing emotion. Right? So that even when we do put things off, we do some peculiar things. We often do things like, well, I've asked people, and they say, well, I clean my house, I cook. We do these things that have this moral connotation of, I ought to do these things too, it's just not this. And we all know the, the example of when I'm putting off one thing and I'm doing a different academic task. And next week, I'm doing that academic task instead of yet another one that is bothering me even more. So we do this interesting task management project to make ourselves feel good. In fact, I have a doctoral student right now examining just that process, how we manage our emotions by managing our tasks. But that gets me a little bit ahead of our story. But I do want to say to you that these three slides, in everyday experience tell us that we know lots about procrastination. We think it's about having fun and it's not. We think that we're not affecting future self and we are. And it's all about giving in to feel good. So if I stop there right now, you've already got some important information. And if someone said to you, what did you learn in school today? You might say, procrastination is about feeling good now. And it is. But we want to know more about it to make sense of it in terms of helping students. Formally, procrastination has a rather mundane definition. It doesn't seem so bad. It means to put forward to tomorrow. It belongs to tomorrow. So what's the big deal? Some things do belong to tomorrow. Well, in everyday language, we know this, that tomorrow is a mystical land where 98% of all human productivity, motivation, and achievement are stored. I will do it tomorrow. But lots of things do belong to tomorrow. And we have to distinguish between procrastination and delay. Here's one of my graduate students, Mohsen Hegman, and he's doing an, an amazing doctoral thesis, creating a new measure of procrastination. And as he's done the hard work of examining the construct, he can tell you that as research psychologists think about it, 
Procrastination is the gap between intention and action. That's the first part of it. For example, if someone says to you, you've got an assignment due Friday, and they're telling you that today, and you think about it and you look at the assignment and say, that's going to take me about an hour. I'll do it Thursday night. That's not necessarily procrastination because you're making your intention to do it Thursday night. Now, if Thursday night comes and you go, ah, I'll just watch a bit of TV first and I'll just surf the net or whatever, now you're procrastinating because now you've got a gap between intention and action. And the other thing, it has to be voluntary. I was saying a minute ago, many things belong to tomorrow. I'm a, a dinosaur dad. I'm a 57-year-old guy with a 5-year-old and a 7-year-old. I got little kids. And so there's lots of things in my life that get put off. This talk almost got put off today because I was worried one of my children might be staying home from school today. And if that was the case, I would have said to you, I can't come. Well, it wouldn't have been procrastination. Now, that doesn't mean it couldn't have been. Can you imagine if I had a real, a real fear of speaking? And then I thought, oh, God, they've asked me to do this talk. I really don't want to do it. I'll tell them my kids are sick. <laughs> well, see, now I'm procrastinating. And there's a difference between these two. But, you know, we have to delay things. And the distinction is important for graduate students because a lot of us beat ourselves up unnecessarily. We put things off because we have to, because we're truly, really busy. And then we think, oh, I'm such a terrible procrastinator. And I think that was part of the story of this one 30-year-old thir woman I interviewed who had two masters, a law degree, working on her PhD, and was constantly in a state of worry and panic because she couldn't, you can't get a PhD done overnight. Right? Well, the easiest way to remember that is that all procrastination is delay, but not all delay is procrastination. And sometimes you, that's the, the thing you have to do first is ask yourself, is there any way I could do this now? Like, I can't, and so I can just delay it. Now, the reverse is true. We sometimes try to self-deceive ourselves into thinking, oh, no, this can wait, when in fact, it's the worst thing in the world for it to wait. That distinction is enormously important. We'll probably come back to it. So what about the cost of procrastination? Well, some of the most interesting research that's been done here at Carleton was done by one of our former students, who's now a Canada, a Tier 2 Canada research chair and professor at Bishop's University. She was in our department and completed her PhD in 2004. And Fuchsia did research to show that, yes, we all know that it affects our performance. In fact, many studies have shown that. But she also showed us that it affects our well-being. We don't feel very good about ourselves, and it affects our health. That those people who procrastinate report more somatic complaints, more headaches, more stomach aches, and they're actually more ill more often. There's a bit of a nuance to that. In 1997, uh, Diane Tice and Roy Baumeister published a paper that showed that those students who procrastinated in the fall term were actually happier and healthier than those students who didn't procrastinate. Why? Because they were living in a complete illusion, right? Uh, the world's great, and, and I think most students do this in September, right? September just whips by and you go, whoa, what happened, right? And there was nothing due, and everyone's feeling great. And then October comes, and it's like, oh, my God, right? That's what undergraduates are feeling, and graduate students can feel the same way. Of course, what Diane Tice and Roy Baumeister found in their study in the second term was the procrastinators paid a huge toll for that. Now, the non-procrastinators were looking healthier and happier than the procrastinators who were begging doctor's notes and calling in sick much more frequently. So procrastination isn't just a, a matter of all-nighters. Procrastination isn't just a matter of affecting one's own self as well. We sometimes refer to this as second-hand procrastination, just like second-hand smoke, that my procrastination affects others. I can take an example with my family. I could be at work and I'm having to do something that I don't want to do. I mean, I don't know a day that goes by where that doesn't happen, right? Think of a day and think, was there something in that day where I didn't have something I didn't want to do? There's a double negative for you. Like that you think about and you think, yeah, there's so many things in my day that I think I just have to suck it up and do it. Well, if I procrastinate in the afternoon, but it really is due tomorrow, I go home that evening and my son will say, let's play. Or Can you, do you have time to read stories? And I might say, no, I've got to work on that report. So now the downstream effects of my procrastination are played out with others. And of course, we see it in other ways too, the stress. So one of the things that Fuchsia found in her research about health is that procrastination has direct and indirect effects on health. The direct effects are really through stress. And so the stress that I carry is also then just given to the world around me. The printer breaks 
because I've procrastinated, now it's a national emergency. Someone's got to run to Staples and get a new cartridge, right? Now, if I'd done the work in a decent time, this wouldn't be the problem. So stress then becomes a secondary problem for other people as well. And of course, the indirect effects of procrastination on health come through things like reduced wellness behaviors, like you're not exercising, you're not eating well, you're not sleeping well, as well as f uh, treatment delay. Oh yeah, I think I'll look after that later. What do you mean? You've had that lump for two weeks. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll check it into it later. It's interesting, I have a colleague in the U.S. now who just finished doing some work with us in a special issue of a journal on this. He's looking at older people. Because it's one thing for you or I to ignore something for a little bit. It's something altogether different when a 65-year-old says, I'll look at it later. There might not be a later, right? So procrastination and effects on health vary in the context as well. But finally, and I think this is really important in a profoundly existential way, is that a few years back, I went to a conference that I don't usually attend, and it was done by clinicians. I'm a researcher, not a clinician. And these people were look at death and bereavement. And when they were talking in one session, they talked about the regrets of those who were bereaving someone who just, they loved that just died. And so I pushed them a bit. I said, what do you mean? Like, what, what was the nature of these regrets? And sure enough, what it came down to is where they held the deepest regrets was that their own procrastination. We intended to do this and we didn't. And so at its heart, procrastination is a deeply existential issue with not getting on with life itself. And I say that to you today not so much as a TA but as a graduate student. That when you're struggling with these things, you can look at some of the techniques we're going to do later. But basically it comes down to this profound moment of coming to terms with yourself and your agency. Are you taking control of your life and having some sense of agency and saying, yeah, I'm doing my thesis, as opposed to just coasting and skating and trying to fool everybody, including yourself? It's profoundly important because in life we're going to run out of time. And the most precious thing we have in life is time. In fact, that's why in every major religion there's this notion of sloth. There's not a major world religion that doesn't have it. Because the seen as the biggest sin that one can create is, is to waste that which is really irreplaceable, which is time. All other things are renewable resources in many ways. Time is not. So I'm often asked, so how prevalent is procrastination? This is a good friend and colleague at DePaul University in Chicago, Joe Ferrari. He's published more than anyone else on this topic, and he can tell you that about 20% of the normal population, just a regular population across a variety of countries around the world, report chronic procrastination. Procrastination to a point where it affects their lives. And having had a website about procrastination since 1995, I can tell you that I get emails from people all over the world that are saying, I'm going to lose my job, I'm going to lose my marriage if I don't stop this. So it's really problematic for people. And I've given workshops for all sorts of kinds of people, including lawyers seem to think this is a big problem that they have. I think sometimes they confuse delay with procrastination, but they really feel punished by this. So lots of people do it. Well, with students, that's a whole other story, and I think that's why lots of you have come today. It is 95% of students report procrastination. It's a huge issue, and it affects really all of us at some point in time. It affects graduate students in a big way. Right? There's nothing worse than a thesis project or a comprehensive exam. In fact, one of those moments, those crystal clear moments for me came from my doctoral research where I was interviewing a doctoral student who wasn't doing anything. I said, well, what are you supposed to be working on? She said, my comprehensive exams. Well, why aren't you doing anything on it? I don't know what to do. Well, why don't you ask your advisor? Oh, I can't let him know I'm not doing anything. <laughs> right? And I thought, oh, this is a terrible catch-22. So it affects all of us. And there's a certain irony in there, too, when a lot of us are here as TAs thinking we're going to help other students who are procrastinating. We think, if they only knew. You know. And I have graduate students now that do that, and yet we'll be TAs working with other students, and we'll tell them, you better get that assignment in on time. And two days later, they'll say, I didn't get that chapter written. Right? It, it affects us all. One of the big things I want you to take away today is that procrastination is a, not a time management issue. It doesn't do anybody any favors to give a student a date planner or a new app for their iPhone to help them manage their time. 
It isn't about time management. Although we like to believe that, you know, the procrastinator's clock is like this. They're somehow broken. I had a student in the 1990s who had a very cognitive bent. He liked to think about how people think. He said, yeah, I think procrastinators are broken. They can't tell time. So he did a really classic experiment where he didn't know whether someone was high or low in procrastination when they were coming into the lab. But he put them in a room and he had them do math problems just to distract them. But then he was asking them to estimate time. So after he'd, he'd stop them and say, how much time has gone by? And these were short periods of time, like 30 seconds, 45 seconds, 60 seconds, two minutes. And in, lo and behold, he had two types of people coming in, people who scored high in procrastination and low in procrastination. And his basic hypothesis was those poor procrastinators, they'll really make a mistake here. And what did he find? No difference. They, they, had, they were fine with that. Well, I had another student named Brian Salmon. I just love this guy. He was a, an exceptional young man who came back to his studies late in life. And if we had lots of time, I'd tell you lots about him. But he died in his fourth year while he was doing his thesis with me. Yeah, really tragic uh, day, October 20th, 1996, he passed away. And uh, so we published this study and finished this study in his honor. Uh, but he had this great idea, which was, and he'd be, he'd be one of your professors now, right? It's amazing. He, he really turned a corner in his life, straight A-plus student, amazing guy. In any case, um, what Brian said, well, okay, Aaron didn't find a difference, but that's because it's just short periods of time. Anybody can do that. But these procrastinators are going to be different when they, these procrastinators are going to be different when they actually study for an exam. And so he did a simple thing. He gave them a calendar for the next two weeks because everybody in the class had an exam in two weeks. And he said, tell me when you're going to study and for how long. Just make a plan. Tell me what you're going to do. Then he collected them up and he gave them a blank set. And he said, now keep track of when you study and for how long. Now he thought that those poor procrastinators, they'd suffer from this thing called the planning fallacy. They're going to get all this work done. They're going to study early. They're going to study lots. And then when he gets their calendars back, they're not going to live up to that. He didn't find that. He didn't find more planning fallacy between the procrastinators and non-procrastinators, but he did find a difference. The procrastinators studied less and studied later, but they knew that. When they handed in their plans, they said, the exam's Friday. I'll probably start studying Thursday afternoon. Right? So they know who they are. It's not a time management issue. In fact, along with a a uh, artist in the Ottawa Valley, if you're a canoeist, you might recognize his name. Paul Mason comes from the Mason family, and he's still a famous whitewater paddler and writes books about that, and a great artist, and he has helped me with these. He draws all of these, and we did these cartoons together, and I start here with my protagonist who says, I have way too much to do. You know, you can see he's bummed out, and this little fish here saying, come on, feed me. And his well-meaning friend says, make a schedule. So he goes, great, I'll make a daily planner. When to schedule TV and on Thursday, finally finished my planner, everything's under control. Now look what he's doing. I thought you were busy, what are you doing? My planner says I don't start until tomorrow. Right? It isn't a, an issue that way. In fact, I find that people who make lists and do their planners, this is the effect on them. They go, oh good, it'll work. Because you're freaking out and you think, how am I going to get all this done? So you pull out your day planner and you do this plan and all of a sudden you feel in control again. But if you look what you said you're going to do right now, it's almost empty. Right? You, you, most of us do start or at least become more ambitious. I meet with many of my students. I just met with one before I came here. And I know when he left that meeting, he wasn't necessarily going right away to write. Right? He's thinking, okay, that's enough for today on my thesis. Right? It's, it's these real funny things we do with time management. In my own life, reporters will often ask me, do you procrastinate? I used to procrastinate a lot, trust me. Do I procrastinate now? Almost never. Just because I, I know too much. And I can't do the self-deception. So I make use of the smallest bits of time to get things done. Now part of that's being a parent too. Because busy people get things done. It's like you think, if I don't get this done now, there isn't a tonight or 11 o'clock tonight. And part of it's being 57 as well. Because it used to be I could work till 3 o'clock in the morning and get up and go. It doesn't happen anymore. Right? So, Part of it is just that reality of I know my own limits, but part of it is that I also know that, you know, writing a letter really can take me 15 minutes. Just do it now. And holy mackerel, do you ever feel good? And now, what we've learned from research as well is there's an upward spiral of well-being. Making even a little bit of progress on our goals fuels us. If you can help students make even a little bit of progress, help them do 15 minutes of work, you're on the right track there. But what just happened here? 
Like, how did it go from distress to, hey, everything's working? Well, part of the answer here is that everything feels under control, but it's bigger than that, and that's where I'm going to get into this notion of the procrastination puzzle. So Paul took this and he made a puzzle for me. And really now when I think about my research and I think about the students who work with me, I think, what piece of the puzzle are you grabbing? Now I've taken the puzzle apart and I think the central piece is this. Procrastination, as you know, is that gap between intention and action. But I haven't introduced, introduced this part to you yet. It's weakness of will. It's exerting self-control or not. So, for example, you've finished dinner and you've made an intention to work on your thesis tonight. And you finish dinner and you think, maybe I'll just clean those cupboards out. Ah, yeah, a million things go through your mind. It's like that your, your desk or your office is the, op the same pole of a magnet as you. You're both positive or both negative because you go towards it and it just repels you, right? It, you, you, and you find it is so subtle. Like you find yourself doing stuff and you think, no, I said I was going to my office. Why am I doing this? Oh, because this will only take a minute. Right? And that's a rational choice over an irrationally short period of time because a minute later you're faced with the same decision. And then pretty soon you go, oh, there's no time left. But let's go back to where I started and say, I said I was going to work on my thesis. Now, first of all, that's too vague. That's just way too vague. And I'll come back to that in a minute too. But you have a moment now where you have to exercise self-control. It's a real precipitous moment. You're either going to work or you're not going to work. And that really means the exertion of self-control and willpower. I'm going to come back to willpower later because it's a contentious issue. But at its heart, it is about weakness of will and it is about self-regulation. But in this case, procrastination is self-regulation and failure. And in fact, it, it's akin to all sorts of other kinds of self-regulation failure, like buying stuff you can't afford or eating more than you need or problematic gambling. All of these things are the same weakness of will because on the one hand we know what we should be doing and the other hand we can't bring ourselves to do it. If you didn't know then it wouldn't be weakness of will but you think I've made the intention I know it's in my best interest to study tonight and I'm not doing it. So as I unpack the procrastination puzzle the question becomes well what is it that influences my own giving in to feel good? I want to feel good now. When I think about my thesis I go, oh, yeah, geez, I don't know what to do on it. It's too big. Or I, I, every time I write this draft, I just, it just gives it back to me or she gives it back to me, right? It, there's a lot of emotions that come with it. And if I avoid it, I feel better. It's classic negative reinforcement. I don't know about you. No, you wouldn't have seen this movie, but I happened to watch it with my kids on the weekend, Ghostbusters 1. <laughs> I, I watched that as a kid because I was young when it came out. But in Ghostbusters, Bill Murray was uh, this crazy psychologist who really <laughs> was a charlatan. And at one point in, in the movie, he said he was doing work on negative reinforcement. But what he was doing is shocking the young man for making mistakes. That's punishment. Negative reinforcement is getting rid of a negative stimulus. So negative reinforcement is it's raining out and if I put up an umbrella, I stop the rain from falling on me. So putting up the umbrella gets reinforced because I got rid of that negative stimulus which was getting wet. Same thing if I go outside and it's cold and I put on a coat, I, I get rid of the cold, I, I warm, I get rid of the negative stimulus, the, the cold. Well, what happens with procrastination? Well, I'm having negative emotions when I think about the task and if I avoid the task, I feel better. So now I've reinforced it by getting rid of the negative emotions. Very powerful. I establish a procrastination habit. That's what habits are, right? And so it's a very difficult thing to get rid of. It doesn't get, you don't get rid of it overnight. So when you're helping students, don't think that you're going to be able to lay a hand on them and go heal and that it's going to be over because this is a habit and it's going to take a lot of work to change it. And what you might get from this talk today is different places as you listen to students or you look at your own life and say, yeah, this is the issue. Let's start here to try to make these changes to the habit. Because it's very reinforcing to give in to feel good. It happens all the time. So what are the other pieces of the puzzle? Well, I'm going to argue with you over the next 26 minutes and two seconds that part of it is personality. It's the way we're made. 
Part of it is the nature of our goals and intentions. Part of it is what we think and believe, and part of it is this notion of self-control and willpower that I introduced you to a minute ago. So we have to consider each of these, and as you're listening now, since we've laid the groundwork, I'm hoping what you might take notes on is, so what would I do in each one of these cases? Because I'm going to give you an idea as we go along about, so how do you intervene if that's your goal? Or how do you suggest change to someone? Or what am I going to do differently? Because that's what most of us listen for. Right? Is that how, how am I going to take this away in my own life? So personality is the first one. And personality is a funny thing because, well, can we really change it? Not very easily. Personality, you could at least say it's a habit. It's shaped partly by genetics. All of our major personality traits show heritability coefficients of like 50%. So it is something that's bred in the bone, so to speak. And then it's learned as well, but learned means habits. So our personality is a rather stable aspect of us. It doesn't mean it's unchangeable. It's just not that changeable. And we know, for example, that people who are conscientious, conscientious means that they're dutiful, they're self-disciplined, they're, they are um, organized structured. They don't procrastinate much because they're almost the antithesis of procrastination. They're dutiful, they're self-disciplined, right? And so they, they come into the world in a way that has set them up for achievement. And those of us who are opposite to this, and you can find this, like there's a guy named uh, Samuel, oh, what's his last name? Gosling. Sam does interesting work out of the University of Texas at Austin. He can assess personality by going into your room. And he can look for cues of personality. And one might be, for example, I walk into your room and like there's clothes all over the floor and your desk is a mess and nothing's organized. I start to think you're probably not very conscientious. And if you're not very conscientious, you're at risk for procrastination. That's the way you might think of it. And that means you have to work harder at other aspects of this puzzle. And many people who you meet who have problems with procrastination will start here. But it's far from the whole story. It's always person and situation. Another person who suffers from procrastination is someone who's really high in impulsivity. They can't shield one intention from another intention. So anyone that you meet who, as you're listening to their story, they say, well, why didn't you do that assignment last night? Well, a buddy came over and said, let's go watch the hockey game, and I was gone. Right? Well, the intervention is around impulsivity, and I'm going to give you a, a specific strategy for that in a few more minutes. So that's a risk factor, impulsivity. And one of the ways you get around that is making a pre-decision, and I, I will talk about that. There are two others that I'll talk about in a little more detail because there's some myths around them and because they're desperately important. And the first one is perfectionism. Gordon Flett is a colleague from York University, a Canada research chair. And just yesterday in my email box, I got the notice of a special issue of the Journal of Irrational Emotive and Cognitive Behavioral Therapy that Gord and I did a special issue for. So it's the kind of thing we live for as academics, right? I got a whole special issue on procrastination with Gord and it just came out yesterday. So it's a, he's near and dear to me, a very talented researcher, as you might know from being a Canada research chair. Well, he's, he, his expertise is on perfectionism. He looks a lot at how people think and because of that he's had an interest in procrastination too. Now, there's no more statistics in my talk than these, so if you don't like stats, don't worry about it. But you know correlation coefficient shows how much something's related. You can see that these numbers are basically zero, and these numbers aren't. And they have that magical asterisk next to them that says these are statistically significant, meaning given chance that is occurring, we would not see numbers like this by chance alone very often. So we're willing to say something's going on here. So the question is, what's going on here? Well, there's two flavors of perfectionism we're focused on. The self-oriented perfectionist, people who do things well for themselves because they just like to do things well. They're probably pretty conscientious too. And those people who are socially prescribed perfectionists who are trying to live up to other people's standards. These are people who have their mother's voice in the back of their head. Those dishes could be cleaner. 95%, that's good. What happened to the other 5%? So that kind of internal dialogue. And so what do we see here? Those people whose perfectionism can be driven by unrealistic, unrealistic uh, standards can, are, are more prone to procrastination. Sorry about my phone, I should have shut it off. I wanted to answer that call, but I didn't. <laughs> so socially pre pre prescribed perfectionists are living up to other people's standards, have a lot of internal negative talk, and sure enough, we do find 
that on different measures of procrastination, you don't need to know the details, they do procrastinate more often. So perfectionism on its own isn't necessarily a problem. It depends on what flavor of per perfectionist you are. Emotional intelligence. Well, I think everything about procrastination has to do with emotion. In fact, if you invited an economist here, particularly a behavioral economist, they'd tell you a different story. And this is where I disagree with behavioral economists all the time. They talk about the rational agent. And of course, the rational agent looks for the most utility. And they'd say, well, what's the best thing to do now is the thing that brings the most utility. And I think, Phew, too cold a process. It's like, do I feel like it? Don't I feel like it? Like it's a hot process. And so what we find here, and Eric Hewart is uh, recently graduated with his MA from Carleton, and we're working on a paper right now with Mohsen, the PhD student you saw earlier, about emotional intelligence. And Eric did a, s a thesis to show that, yes, the higher your emotional intelligence, the lower your procrastination. So if you can just get in touch with your emotions and realize, yeah, this thesis is scaring the SHIT out of me, then you're more likely to harness your emotions and do something with it. But emotional intelligence is something you can learn. It's not trait-like, it's more skill-like. So we can do things to help students develop emotional intelligence. And right now I'm advocating, for example, at the university, we spend more time in first year helping students develop that along with self-regulatory skills. And in fact, I have a PhD student now, Terry Lee McPherson, who's looking at just emotional regulation and procrastination. Because I would argue, to the extent that you can manage your emotions, you'll manage your procrastination. It's a matter of being able to say, I said I'm going to do this now. It doesn't really matter how I feel. I'm going to sit down and work on it. Tonight, for, as a thought experiment, just try to monitor your emotional reaction to your work over time. And you know the kind of roller coaster that is. And for some of us, remember I talked about conscientiousness already. I didn't talk about neuroticism. Neuroticism is basically emotional stability, or the inverse of it, emotional instability. So people who are higher in neuroticism are more anxious, more depressed, more self-conscious. I score very high in neuroticism. As much as I'm extroverted and I'm an outgoing person, I'm also a very neurotic person, which is a good thing because it kept me in graduate school. Extroverts typically don't do well in graduate school. Introverts do. But neurotic extroverts can, can survive because they worry too much about failing, so they get back to their desk. So neuroticism, we're all just different, and we have to learn to harness that. And in fact, if you look, those of us who are very neurotic, if you look at your emotional reaction to your work, it's way out of proportion. Like it's, I'm, I'm feeling terrible. I get a little work done. Oh, I feel great for a minute. Like it's just a horrible roller coaster ride. So that's another place that we have to look at intervening, especially at our own selves. Yes. What was the, the red um, puzzle piece there? This one over here? I can't read the writing. I can't read. It says using emotions. So you've got to perceive your emotions and use your emotions. And, and some, we, many of us can use our positive emotions, but not always the best way. Like, if you look at what procrastinators often do, they'll stay up and do an all-nighter. They'll get it in. They'll feel elated. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the problem with that later. But now, they don't use those positive emotions to go on and do another assignment. It's like, now I can celebrate. Now, and, and so you get this kind of work that goes like this. And Skinner described that a long time ago. It's more like a scallop. When's it do? Work, do nothing. When's it do? Work, do nothing. As opposed to what real learning is, which is constant. You know, I'm studying for this amateur radio license, and I'm studying constantly, and I'm breaking it down. And I'll use 20 minutes here and there to learn the alphabet code internationally that way or to learn all these other esoteric things that truly are memory. But I know I can't cram for that. I have to spread it out. I have to practice it. And so I have to learn to use my emotions. Understanding your emotions, that you're going to have negative emotions, you don't always feel good about your work, and managing your emotions so that even though I feel terrified, I don't have to run away. One of my favorite educators, and this is a different topic, but introduce you to Parker Palmer. He wrote the book, The Courage to Teach. And one of my favorite quotes from that book, it's a great book if you're looking for a book to read about teaching, The Courage to Teach by Parker Palmer. He wrote, I can have fear, I need not be my fear. And many of us need to hold on to that in different parts of our lives. Sometimes in the most mundane thing, like facing an assignment, and sometimes in the most profound things, like being a police officer, where I think fear can be a, a, a daily part of life, right? That I can have fear, I need not be my fear, and he adds, because I can work from some other part of my inner landscape. Well, that's what emotional intelligence is to say, so what else is going on inside of me? My curiosity. I could work from my curiosity. 
OK. I'm going to skip over this. I'm going to tell you just something briefly about this. Procrastination has a developmental aspect to it. We beat up on young people all the time. There's two things I'll tell you. The first is not on this slide, so I'll shut that off for a minute. That's the best button on this thing, so you can't read that slide. I have young children, and if I gave my son, who's just five, some tasks, like money or volume, the other day he showed me candy from Halloween. They were the same type of candy, but one was long and many candies, but smaller, and one was larger candies, but shorter. And you know he made the classic uh, mistake in estimating which had more by saying the longer one had more, because it was bigger that way, and it had more candies. So I tried to introduce him to mass by getting out a scale and weighing them and say, well, this one weighs more. And I said, so which one has more candy? And he still did, went back. And, because it's a developmental thing, right? It's, he, his brain can't do that yet. Now, you can try to, to bridge that. Piaget calls it one plus stage matching. But you, you can't push people past their developmental readiness. OK, so what about procrastination? There's two things going on. The prefrontal cortex is the last part of our brain to develop. And so all these young people running around, that part of their brain is still yet undeveloped. And it takes into late teens and early adulthood for that to mature. And so it, we're already working uphill in that battle at the level of our physiology in terms of our brain. But the other thing is, this is a student who did his honors thesis with me, who's finishing up his PhD at the University of Western Ontario. And he came into me, my office one day when he was going to do his honors thesis and said, I think people don't have an identity procrastinate more. So he did a classic study, which I won't tell you about in detail, just in the interest of time. But I'll tell you that, yes, if you've achieved your identity, you're less likely to procrastinate. So students at school who are still, still exploring who they are, who don't know what they want to major in, no wonder they're putting things off. Now, there's a more complicated answer to all that, but I want you to take away that, yeah, this is a developmental thing, too. You've got to watch how much I expect of everyone and that we can't expect an 18-year-old to act like a 25-year-old even. And there's good reasons for it, just like I don't expect my son to. We're going to expect my son to do some things cognitively. So that's all about personality. And now I'm going to pick the pace up a little bit. What about the task? Well, I'm not going to tell you all about these things, but I'm going to start with the fact that, yeah, there's something about task aversiveness, and there's something about how we think about the task. Alan Blunt, he's an instructor in the Center for Initiatives and Education. He's doing his PhD with me right now. He did a very interesting study a few years ago that uh, is still well cited. He said, yeah, you know, everyone gets procrastinates on things they find aversive, things they don't like to do. But the nature of aversiveness varies depending on where you are in your project. You know, at the beginning, you might say things like, I think I'll do my master's. And then you start planning your master's. And then you get into the action stage. Well, the nature of aversiveness changes as you go. For example, at all stages, whether something's boring, frustrating, or if you resent it, is related to procrastination and, and aversiveness. If it's boring and frustrating and you resent it, you're, you don't want to do it. <clears throat> but at the inception and planning stage, if something's not personally meaningful, then you find it aversive. You say, I don't really want to do my master's. <laughs> like, it's not meaningful to me. You're more likely to procrastinate filling out the application. Or more likely on your thesis, if you go, what a stupid topic. I hate it. You're likely to procrastinate at that point. But many of us will find a really interesting topic, and then all of a sudden we find later on we're procrastinating. Why? Because in the action phase, task aversiveness is related to, do you know how to do it? Is it structured well? And that's where advisors make a difference. So where can we make a difference as TAs? In the action phase of a project, make sure you're helping them structure it. In the inception stage and planning stage of a project, make sure that you're helping people find meaning. Really clear intervention strategies there, right? If they're just thinking about a topic, make sure that you help them connect to something that really connects with them. But if they're past that and it's the action phase, make sure they know what the steps are. And that leads me to my next point. I joked a moment ago when I saw this gentleman here smile when I said it, when I said that it's too vague to say I'm working on my thesis. In fact, if I ask one of my students, what are you doing, and they say working on my thesis, I know do it, they're doing nothing. <laughs> because they're, that, that's everything and, and nothing, right? But if I, if I say, what are you doing? And they say, well, I'm struggling with that paragraph we were talking about last time about how to explain how I'm scoring my dependent variable. I go, they're doing something. right? And that's the whole point. And that's what this slide is about, which is full of text. And you can read it if you'd like. 
But temporal construal theory is the notion that the way we construe things affects us in our temporal perception of it. I'll put that in even more simple terms. When I think about things concretely, they belong to today. And when I think about things abstractly, they belong to tomorrow. And we didn't know that until recently. Your grandmother could have told you, break it down. You know, like Bill Murray was in another great movie once, uh, What About Bob? And, and, and he said, take baby steps. And so everyone tell you, yeah, break it down, take baby steps. But what we've learned most recently in this work, theoretically, is that when you think about things concretely, your brain thinks these are urgent. When you think about abstractly, you go, oh yeah, manana, manana, no, no rush. So what's the next thing is help students break it down. Not in that, don't sound like they're high school teachers. Tell them that when we break it down, not only do we know what the next step is, which is crucial to this, we also, our brains go, this is more urgent, and we get it done. I'm going to skip over that. I'm not going to tell you too much about uh, the way we think, because you're not going to be able to influence that as much. I'll tell you just one thing. This is my colleague that's doing the work in the U.S. at the University of U Louisiana about older people. And he's done some fantastic things about the way procrastinators think. Like, look at this one. I'm thinking now that I'm simply too stupid to benefit from more studying. So I'll just hang out on Facebook. These, are, these were things that people who were procrastinating. Now, notice I'm not calling them procrastinators. In his research, he actually had people that were procrastinating at that moment writing to him. And so these are the kind of things we think. But I'm not going to go any further than that. I am going to talk a little bit about this irrational thought. Do you have your homework finished, Jeremy? Not yet. I'm waiting for the mood to strike me. Adrenaline-fueled panic is not a mood. Are you sure I never get anything done without it? Well, I put a comic together this way, too. Kyle Simpson was another one of my master's students. He published this paper in 2009 about arousal. For a thrill seeker, you open your shirt, shoot early. No, I haven't repacked it since our last jump. Procrastinating? I work faster under pressure. You mean like cramming for an exam? Sure. Shouldn't you start cramming your shoot in? Uh, maybe I could share yours. Right. So a lot of us believe that we work better under pressure. It's nonsense. We don't work better under pressure. We've seen so many studies that show that we make more errors of omission or, or more errors of commission. Many of us only work under pressure. We need someone to literally light a fire under us for us to get moving. It's, if we look at it, it's rather pathetic. That's one of the reasons I can't procrastinate anymore because I think, how pathetic do I want to be here? How much pressure do I need to just get up and do it? Now, I just gave this talk in Toronto, and that's why you see over here Canadian Coalition of Self-Directed Learning. I gave this talk in Toronto to a group of educators from across Canada mm, October 18th or 19th. And I met an educator there named Vince Gassy. And he heard my talk and he came up to me and I said, I got to send you a quote from his own thesis. And this was the quote. The mental discipline necessary to work toward a deadline is something that you must develop. It can become a habit just as letting things slide into the last minute can become a habit. That pattern leads to staying up all night and writing in blind panic. Besides ruining your health, you can never write your best. If anyone tells you you have to wait till the pressure is on before I can start to cook, don't believe it. Occasionally, you may be able to work under pressure of a deadline, but stop kidding yourself. It won't be your best. I thought, what a powerful quote. He summed it all up. And where does this come from? Advanced technique, techniques for film scoring a complete text. Every professional knows this. Every writer knows this. I'll show you one more quote. Then there's those other days, the ones in which you get up, have breakfast, take a shower, feeling fresh as a daisy, you sit down to work, turn on the idea faucet, and nothing comes out but air. You stare at the paper until it starts to burn, and all the while your brain is slowly turning to jelly. As a good friend Quincy Jones described it, I've been under the piano all day, rolling on the floor and chewing the rug, and this turkey is due tomorrow morning. Well, take heart, you're not alone. All over the world at this very moment, there are composers just like you who are rolling on the floor and chewing the rug. Like it was so powerful that he heard my talk and he said, yeah, you know what, we get it in the music industry. We have deadlines and we think that we should work better under pressure, but we have to develop a different habit. So it's just wonderful when, when you share one way and people give back another, right? I gave this lecture and instead I got a conversation. Okay. The one part I did want to talk about is this. I told you about Fuchsia Sirwan passing. She did the health study. She got her PhD from Carleton in 2004. And I love it because now she's a full professor in Canada Research Chair. I remain an associate professor and just going on my own way. It's great to see your students just completely surpass you, right? And she's just one of those people. She's done a great job. And she's done this interesting study about counterfactuals. 
What's a counterfactual? It's thinking counterfactual to what happened. So I get a C. Ever get a C as a graduate student? No, there's a lot of grade inflation. But if you got a C, you, you go, uh-oh. <laughs> you, you'd have to think counterfactually. So one counterfactual is downward. Could have been worse. Could have failed. The upward counterfactual is, if only I'd studied longer, or if only I studied earlier, upward, downward. What kind of counterfactuals do procrastinators make more often? What's that? Could have been worse. Could have been worse. The downward counterfactual. Why? Because it makes you feel better. You're going, oh my God, a C. Could have been worse. Oh yeah. Whew. If you think to yourself, oh, if I only started sooner, now you're feeling even worse. What's the whole story about again? Giving in to feel good. So the way we think is a big pattern. So why don't I procrastinate anymore? Because the moment I start hearing myself say anything like this, I can do it tomorrow, or if uh, it could have been worse, I realize, Tim, you're excuse making. Okay, I'm going to leave that. I'm going to go to self-control because I only have four minutes and 52 seconds left. I told you that it's really an issue of willpower and self-control. Willpower is like a muscle. Even if I took this gentleman here who I've been picking on because he's big, and I'm going to pick on him again because he's large. I, he's, we can all see that he's strong, and I'd say, could you pick up this chair? And we all know he could pick up this chair. And I'd say, well, you continue to pick up this chair for the next 10 minutes while I talk. At some point, he wouldn't be able to pick it up anymore. Lactic acid built up in his muscles. I'd say, can you pick up this computer? No, I can't pick up anything else. Right? Willpower is like that. It's like a muscle. And that's some important work that Roy Baumeister, I've mentioned his name before about health and procrastination, has, he and his students have shown us that we just wear it out. And we have a limited supply of it. So if you're trying to quit smoking and exercise more and lose weight, forget it. It isn't going to happen because you're going to run out of willpower. It's not completely gone, however. Our, we're really good, you know. We have this evolutionary process that's been very adaptive for us. That's what the, we're the result of. We have a Stone Age brain running around in a modern world. Our Stone Age brain, for example, still thinks that sugar and fat are a good idea because our Stone Age brain was adapted to think when you can get it, eat it. But in a world full of Tim Hortons, not a good idea. Right? It leads to d type 2 diabetes and, and uh, being overweight. And the same thing happens here that we have strategies that we don't even know about. They're all unconscious, just to reserve some willpower. So you can draw it up. And as a parent, I know that every day. Like it, I, you know Homer Simpson, of course, right? You know Homer Simpson. How does he treat Bart Simpson? He chokes him, right? He's the worst parent in the world. And then someday, I think anyone who's a parent thinks, I'm going to turn into Homer Simpson. And then you take a deep breath and go, I don't want to be Homer Simpson. How am I going to drop some willpower? Same thing happens with our work. You're going to get to a point where you say, I've got nothing left. So how do you have more? Well, you have to find out how you're going to draw more. And you can do that through something like value affirmation. Why did I become a graduate student in the first place? Why is it important for me to finish this assignment? That value affirmation is one way around it. We can demonstrate this in simple ways, too. You could say, I couldn't simply do another problem here. And I lay a $100 bill next to you and say, if you do another problem, I'll give you the 100 bucks. <laughs> well, watch how fast the problem gets done. Right? You told me you didn't have anything left. We can find ways to motivate ourselves. I'll, I'll put this up just briefly. Uh, another student did a, a, an early study about mindfulness meditation. And you think, really? It helps? Yeah. So if you like to meditate, keep meditating. Because if you can strengthen your attentional resources, you'll procrastinate less. Because mindfulness meditation has you bringing your attention non-judgmentally back to where it belongs. And if you can do that, you'll procrastinate less. Because you'll say, oh no, I'm not supposed to be doing Facebook right now. I'm supposed to be working on my report or my essay. So mindfulness meditation strengthens attention, and attention strengthens willpower. I'm going to skip over this, and I'm going to give you probably two more slides, because I have a minute and 44 seconds left. And this is the number one thing as a strategy you're going to use with students. The number one thing, because it solves so many things. It solves the impulsivity issue, or it helps uh, do it. It solves the distractibility issue, and it helps make things more concrete. Many of, us, of us, has, have us, many of us have intentions, but they're very weak, really almost anemic goal intentions. Oh, I'm going to work on that assignment tonight. What does that mean? Does it mean you're going to finish it? Does it going to mean you're going to do 10% of it? It's too vague. And what does it mean by tonight? Tonight, as procrastinators know, goes till midnight, or even later. 
right? And so that is a huge problem. So the issue here is you've got to move from goal intentions to implementation intentions. So with every student you ever work with, you, you need to be able to do this. In situation X, what behavior are you going to do, which is Y, to achieve what sub-goal, Z? You could write that down and own it. In situation X, I'm going to do behavior Y to achieve sub-goal Z. You should use it in your own life, and students should use it, because then you can make them accountable. In situation X, when this workshop ends today in another 20, oh, it's actually over. Uh, we're 26 seconds over. When this workshop ends today, I'm going straight to the library to read four pages of that paper that I'm struggling to read to achieve the sub-goal of I need to summarize this thing in my thesis. That's, that's it. And it's magical. Why? Research over and over again shows that people who make implementation intentions follow through on their intentions because the cue for the behavior is in the environment, not you don't have to think. In situation X, oh yeah, the workshop's over. What did I say I was going to do? You just go do it. And it helps people floss their teeth more, take their vitamins, all sorts of health behaviors, and it helps in our work as well. And it's been done directly with um, procrastination. Now, I have a lot of other things that I could tell you about, but you know the great thing about my work is that I actually have done it already. If you've ever been to procrastination.ca, you'll know that I have a blog and a podcast. My podcast is on iTunes. It's all called I Procrastinate. And basically, any topic on procrastination, I already talked about at great length. So if something's grabbed you today, you can go there and learn more about it. If you'd like to read, go to the blog. Because you can read through those are very short. If you like to, if you commute and, or you're doing house chores and you like to listen to a podcast and you want to know more about procrastination, well, I started this in 2006 and it goes on through today and you could listen to these podcasts as well. So I've only introduced you to the basic ideas, but those are the fundamental ones, right? That's the structure where everything else fits. And on the way, I've given you clear strategies to think about with students. Not a whole recipe book yet, partly because of the time, but the most important one I did give you, which is move from goal intentions to implementation intentions, a, a very important first step. I added in there as well, are you aware of your emotions? Do you see the habit? And if I could add one more thing in closing, I'd say help people see their own self-deception and be aware of your own. When is it you're lying to yourself? So you could call a student on it and they say, well, I'm going to work all day Saturday on that. You know, I've decided I'm going to give the whole day to it. I need a whole day to write. I can't write for 30 minutes. That's a place of intervention. Have you ever worked a whole Saturday before on something? Uh, how successful was that? And how did you feel the next day? Were you able to work the next day? Now, I happen to be a person who could sit down at 7 in the morning and walk away from my desk at 11 o'clock at night. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's a virtue. Sometimes it was out of necessity, right, because of bad habits. I don't have to do that in my life anymore because I've learned to work in more regular intervals. Yeah. So now I'm a guy that can get up every day at quarter after 5 because at 9.30 I know I can go to bed because I don't have to think, oh, I've got something to do tomorrow. I have to stay up to do it because the moment you do that, now your whole world comes apart. That was a ton. I have enjoyed all your rapt attention. And I appreciate that very much. And I only wish we had more time to talk. So if you'd like more time to talk, you can tell Joe and we'll set up another one. And if the same people come, I won't put in any slides. We'll just talk with each other. All right. That, that will work very well. But thank you so much for your attention today. <laughs>